Welcome to episode 30 of the Hellbound Podcast. This is an interview that's pre-recorded with Nicholas Vince, who played the Chatterer in Hellraiser and Hellraiser 2. He was also Kinski in Nightbreed, and he's a very close friend of the amazing Clive Barker, and we had a great time with this interview, and please enjoy. Welcome to the Hellbound interviews, firstly, Nicholas. And it's, uh, Thank you, Alex. It's an absolute uh, pleasure, and... Um, what's the significance and what are you using your green screen for at the moment? Um, it's for my new YouTube show, which is just launched at the beginning, well, 8th of October, uh, called The Chattering Hour. Um, and we started with Malcolm McDowell. I saw something about that. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we had Malcolm McDowell and... Um, who else is well? We, Nancy Loomis. I'm a, a Nancy Loomis who um, Annie Brackett from Halloween. Just editing her. Courtney Gaines. They both go live tomorrow. Really do need to get those done. Um, <laughs> it's so much work, isn't it? Yes, <laughs> particularly when you discover that Zoom decided to actually slightly desynchronize Courtney's. Oh. Um, so that was I lost yesterday to basically nudging things just very, very I know uh, the thing yeah. I found is I, I, I record on a separate camera that I feed into my computer and I was recording because I prefer the look of 24 frames I was recording in 24 and then I realised this was at 25 so every time I had cutaways I would, I would use it as a way to sort myself out and it was Oh, for, you know, like for a two-hour podcast, that's a real pain. We have to cut away every fifteen seconds or something. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I don't. Yeah, no, I don't. I and most of the time, I use the Zoom background as well. Actually, I can probably. I got my. Can I choose a virtual background? I might even have a virtual back. Oh, I can actually choose a virtual background is it going to work there we are that's the virtual ah, background oh, that nice. i use I like that. for the yeah that's the but the trouble is with the virtual background and zoom you, my ears disappear because i'm bald yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great and yes um, so. yeah it's uh thank you so much for coming on board this it's a really good timing for us as well because we've got our live um film festival event on friday and uh, this is going to lead up to that uh, so it's really good timing for us. We've, we've just interviewed uh, Jeffrey Reddick, who created uh, Final Destination. Um, right. He's a really top guy, and uh, it's just fun to... Like, like I know you, you must have a huge passion for horror, past the point sure. of, uh, you know, uh, featuring in many of these films. So Sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, how did your kind of love for horror, how did that start? Was it... Because of work, was it because of you loved it when you were young? No, no, it was it was it was back in the days, and we're talking about the nineteen seventies when they used to show the Roger Corman, um, Vincent Price, Edgar Allan Poe films on yeah, Friday great. night. Um, so I'm I'm that was that, those those were my gateway drugs into <laughs> horror. Um, was the bit yeah. surprised Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe things and um, yeah definitely just what kicked off and I think there was that and then there was and then there was the Aurora model kits, glow in the dark monster film land kits which I discovered as well that we had a local um, model shop and they happened yeah. to have these things in and those that must have been in the late sixties, early seventies, that those were available. So I had I had those things. That's great. Uh, I was speaking to uh, one of our judges for the festival, was Ramsey Campbell, who's uh, who knew Clive back in the day, and they kind of know each other a little. I'm not sure if you know Clive, but uh, uh, Ramsey, sorry, obviously yes. you know Clive. Uh, yeah, but yeah. yeah, he was he was um, he was telling me how he started and sneaking into cinemas uh, when he was much younger and kind of finding discovering horror that way and. It's, it's really fascinating finding how people discover their passions and discover the, mm. the, how they lead in, leans into their work. Like Joe Alves is another one of our um, judges. He's a production designer on Jaws. 
and he was saying oh, wow. when when he had it wasn't a club foot it was something like a, a a milder form of something like that and he wanted to go dancing he wanted to be a dancer originally and he couldn't do that obviously and then he ended up drawing and becoming fascinated with architecture so that's how he started and then it led on to you know close encounters escape from new york um so it's it's really fascinating to see how people get into this my uh, my gateway drug so to speak is in a strange way is my it's my elder brother because when i was very young it was child's play it was um the right. first couple of hellraisers it was uh nightmare on elm street was a real a real bad one for me when i was like mm, six or seven years old so it yeah. was you know it's it was sheer nightmares all the time because the visuals as you know are yeah. really strong and yeah. especially 80s stuff and that's what i've kind of gone back on myself instead of having nightmares i kind of want to delve into that now I don't want to kind of see nightmares. I should want to kind of be creative in that field, whether it's right. curating other people's films uh, or um, kind of, you know, just enjoying new content. It's, it's great. And, and thanks to you and uh, you know, the, uh, the other chaps in the team and Clive, it's uh, <laughs> fuck on nightmares now. Yes. Yes. But yeah. yeah. Um, so um, how did you kind of start in, because was Hellraiser your first feature? Yes, Hellraiser was my first feature. Um, Clive, um, I'd known Clive for a while. Um, I've been doing a lot of modelling work for him. And um, I, yeah, it was, you know, he just said, Nick, would you like to be in a horror film? And I'm going, yeah, I'm newly out of drama school, or I've been out of drama school for a couple of years. Um, probably at, at that point, was, was he already painting and did you know of his passion for this kind of thing? Oh yes, no absolutely. I mean Clive, I mean long time before, as I say I'd known Clive for about three years before we made Hellraiser. Um, Clive had been painting since he was writing which was you know since he could I think from my understanding obviously a long time before I met him. So and I'd seen his work. In fact, how I got to know him was by modelling for him for the covers of the Books of Blood, um, oh, the wow. UK editions of the Books of Blood, the hardback editions, because uh, they prom Sphere published the paperbacks first, and then um, Clive did the covers for the hardback editions, uh, and I modelled for those. Um, so that's kind of how I got to know him, basically. Um, so yeah, that, and then he just said, you know, do you want to be in a horror film? I said, yes. <laughs> at what point, I've asked a couple of other filmmakers this and actors, at what point did you realise the significance of not necessarily the Cenobites, but uh, the cultural impact it had, but uh, people's passions for drawing the Chatterer and the other Cenobites, when did that kind of really go, oh my God, this is so... Kind of not necessarily cult. It's it's beyond a cult film, though. I think it's it's a, yeah. it's a cornerstone of horror. I think now. I think it basically it was because I suppose when the film came out, it didn't have a big West End premiere or anything. It just went straight into. But we made or well, Doug Bradley as Pinhead made the front cover of Time Out magazine in London, uh, and there was big spreads. Uh, in that, and it was all over Fangoria uh, magazine. I was aware of Fangoria because some of the guys had shown me that uh, copies of it uh, when we were making Hellraiser, uh, and obviously this was the go-to magazine. And that, but then it was, it was ten years after the, it was the tenth anniversary of the release of Hellraiser. I was invited to the states for the first time. Um. And that's when I, I, wow, gosh, this is, you know, this is big in, in America. But come to think of it, the first Pinhead tattoo I'd seen was when we did Hellbound. It was at a special screening for Hellbound. Because um, I remember Clive being there and, and this guy showing him, he, he had a Pinhead gun up here, so that it's going to be 88, something like that. And I remember, oh, wow, that's, that's extraordinary. And, you know, 
it's been that I'm not surprised yeah I can't remember the first time I saw a, ch a, a chatterer uh, tattoo um, but again it was just kind of like wow that is extraordinary and then uh, obviously I have to say that uh, that is a big um, shout out to Nigel Booth and Clive, the guys who actually designed and created the makeups. I just had to stand there and chat in my teeth. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, I think that's a real homage to their uh, yeah. work, um, particularly. It's, there's something so strong about 80s horror icons. There's, you know, there's so few and far between a truly kind of um, iconic, st there is a few new stories that are like few new horror films but there's so much now uh there's so much kind of content i kind of i go back to the 80s in many ways yes um, yeah yeah because one that we had yeah. we had freddy it was friday the 13th um yeah those those big uh you know, michael myers um yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Mike, yeah. I think Myers was what 79, 78. Maybe. 79. I was Somebody, just going to uh, say yes. I should know this because I just interviewed these. <laughs> <interviewed them. laughs> uh, <laughs> I should know that date off yeah. the top of my head. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, you know, that's it is. You know, when you think of the sequels and so on throughout the the eighties yeah. as well, um, there were some extraordinary things going on in the nineteen eighties in terms of horror. How long did you um, work on the first one compared to the second? Because obviously the setup for the first is much more confined in terms of the loft space and uh, outside the house is the ward, obviously. And, uh, and That's interesting, long... of course, because you're, act you're asking an actor. So, of course, I was only ever called in for when they needed me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, of course, we... I think I probably did more days on the first film than, in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain I did on the first film than I did on the second, because um, there was less for me to do on the second one. Because um, I think because they expanded and it was more Pinhead story, the second one. Um, so I, I do not know the number of days. I've, I have the. I have eight days. I have eight filming days in my mind um, as being a ballpark for the first film, mm -hmm. um, and I think it was probably around about half a dozen on the second film. Did that? Um, did the kind of experience of the makeup and the kind of heavy prosthetics? Um, did that kind of build a? A bond between you as a group? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I got I made really good friends with um, Jeff Portis and Roy Puddyfoot, uh, little John Cormacan um, from uh, Image Animation. Um, so yeah, I, I, because you did. I mean, I spent a lot of time, obviously, hanging out with those guys at the studios of Image Animation before. We actually, before cameras rolled, because you know I went in for live casts, um, and I probably did about two or three days. I made about two or three visits um, to the studios, mm -hmm. uh, and then over the you know the course of the f the three films of Hellraiser, Hellbound, and Nightbreed, I, I got to hang out with them an awful lot. That's pretty cool, and uh, it's. What do you think of its uh, impact now? Because for me, um, Nightbreed has has kind of elevated since the director's cut. Um, well, the the reconstructed cut, I and mean, there's an intro for it. What? Um, just to hop onto that for a sec. What did you think of the not extended version, but you could call it a director's cut. That's how it's branded. What did you think of that? The director. Okay, so. <laughs> Let's just clarify, there are three different versions that I know about. There's the original theatrical cut. There's the Cabal cut, which was put together by Russell Cherrington uh, and others. Um, and then there was the director's cut. Um, I mean, the, I like the director's cut probably more because I got more, I'm in it more. Um, <laughs> that must have been nice though. You know, to, oh yeah, and I, I think for Clive, you know, for Clive more than anything else. And funnily enough, somebody just messaged me um, 
this morning via Facebook. Um, you're obviously familiar with Save the Cat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, they've just shown, they've just published an article of, of the beat sheet for the, uh, the director's cut um, based on Save the Cat. Um, I was reading through that this morning. Um, so I think the, there are different, there are different things to be said for each of those things. We wouldn't have the director's cut if it weren't for the cabal cut, because Absolutely. it was you know, that huge uh, thing of the um, Occupy Midian and all the signatures that actually led to the footage being found that would allow us to actually having uh, the, the director's cut. And obviously none of it would have been there without the theatrical cut to begin with. Yeah. Um, and that wouldn't have been there without Clive putting pen to paper and writing Cabal, the novella on which it's all based anyway. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 it is quite fascinating to me how these things kind of ripple on. What was that? What was it like having? Um, uh, obviously, you went through the um, the process of the prosthetics again. Mm. What was it? How many years difference was it between the two films? I should know. So that. we did. We so Halloween. <laughs> so bad on dates. In fact, I'm just going to That's love fine. this camera <laughs> just slightly. So I'm not looking up. There we are. That I'm suddenly realised I'm looking up at you. Um, so we did. Uh, IMDb question, filmed in 86, released in 87. Hellbound was the following year, and then it was two years after that, Nightbreed. So was it very so similar, was, all... was it very similar um, kind of prosthetics? Well, obviously it's, it was a simpler design, it, 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 Nightbreed? So basically the, um, it was the same crew for both, image animation, it was an expanded crew for a night breed. Yeah. Um, so the, the guys who did, um, Nigel, sorry, to be clear, Chatra in Hellraiser, Nigel Booth. Chatra in Hellbound, Cliff Wallace. He, he did the redesign with the eyes in as well. Neil Gorton uh, from Millennium FX, uh, Doctor Who, etc. Uh, designed and created uh, Kinski, and I believe Mark Coulier, Oscar winner, uh, was the makeup assistant when I was in the chair for Nightbreed. Um, and it was the same uh, cinematographer on, um, and sound guide. I mean, Clive took, you know, most of the crew worked on all three films. Um, in terms of the makeup itself, it was a lot longer to put on Kinski than it was Chatterer because really? yeah because Chatterer was just a single mask um, with a slit up the back um, that kind of went over like a balaclava yeah. Te teeth went in mask on uh, Kinski I think was only seven pieces maybe right but it was still five hours of makeup whereas Chasha was only an hour. Um, oh, wow, that's, that's a huge difference really, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was a quite of so, so basically I got to learn, you know, I learned what um, Doug and Barbie and so on have been through <laughs> on the first, you know, on the, the, the kind of like, you know, it was three o'clock in the morning. So we were, the car was at three o'clock in the morning, um, makeup chair at four o'clock, on set at nine o'clock. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So it's, and then having said all that, of course, the guys who, was, who I just had to sit in the chair whilst they applied the makeup to me, the, the um, guys who were actually on their feet, making sure I looked great, were Neil and, and Mark. Because um, they're, so, they're beautifully like, there's. The scene in towards the end of um, Hellbound, where uh, obviously uh, those character stands up, stands up as a as a defender effectively, and mm. it, it's such a beautifully lit scene, um, and 
was it um it's it's kind of kind of a marvel to look at because that particular scene it there's something about how it's lit that's uh um, you, you it's you don't hardly ever see as dynamic as certain scenes in those films and um i'll tell you a little strange story my um when we were having this house done and there were rooms upstairs that were the there we were uh, bin bags in the windows and the walls had been torn out. I was like, yeah, this looks like uh, Frank's room upstairs. <laughs> and then at night, because there's no lights in the room, I was like, yeah, I'm not going in there. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. But I think this is the, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, this is all Robin Vision, the lighting cameraman. Uh, my favorite moment is from the first movie it's when Julia brings the first victim home. See the glasses. During the first... Yeah. Again? I think it's the businessman with the glasses, I think. Uh, does he have glasses? No, he doesn't have glasses. That's the glasses the one, yeah. third one. Right. It's the first one. And basically, it's so beautifully set up. You've got this kind of stained glass window in the background. And then literally, Julia is hesitating on the threshold between light and dark. Yeah, the hallway in front of her is darkness. There's light behind her, mm -hmm. um, but it's so beautifully lit. You're not really con unless you look at her, you realize that that is literally what she's doing. She's hesitating on the threshold between light and darkness as she makes the decision as to whether or not she's actually going to go through with this. And you know that is obviously down to Clive and um, but Robin Vigil, um, who yeah, really taught Clive everything. Considering that was your, um, considering that that was your first, your first feature, and uh, working with uh, Cronenberg on Nightbreed as well, you know, in terms of on set, you must have been like a sponge for what was going on on on, on set, or at well, least have some sort of take something really kind of positive from it. Yeah, I think I mean the girls the great joke is of course that when I was in, in the chatter and makeup I could hardly hear speak or see. So I had no idea what was going on around me on a set. Um in fact when I got to do Nightbreed, that's when I really learned how to how movies were made because I could see. Because Kinsky has <laughs> it. Um but up until that point I really, you know, um I had no real, I mean, I knew how the makeup stuff was done, knew all the atmosphere in the back. And of course, when we were doing Hellraiser, it was a tiny, tiny studio that we were filming in. Um, so there was no, you know, there was no way you could go and watch things being filmed without being in the way. Ah, uh, yeah, absolutely. So it wasn't until... And then again, you know, you're always discouraged from going on set unless you've got a bloody good reason to be there. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we filmed Hellbound at Pinewood and Nightbreed at Pinewood. Um, but I was literally just being called down and being actually being able to watch what was going on around me on the third on Nightbreed was really when I learned how movies were made. So were you... Um... Was Clive, was Clive going through uh, blocking the scenes to give you direction because you were limited in terms of what you could see or couldn't hear? It's very interesting because, as I say, I could hardly hear, speak or see. Um, I think, you know, we're talking about Simon Bamford was in a very, plays Butterball, was a very similar situation. They didn't really realise how little we could hear. Um, I see. So it, it, I think when they first got us on set, it was like, I have no idea what's going on <laughs> and I'm not responding because I can't hear what's going on. And then they realised what they had to do was bring us onto set, explain to us what it is they wanted to do, show where the marks were. We agreed. I mean, basically they used to, for the chatter, they used to put sandbags on the floor so that as I was walking forward, then I could feel with my feet when oh, I had wow. to stop because that's obviously I had no no clue what was going on otherwise. Um, so it was all those technical, you know, it was all those practical things that they did to help us and just make sure that we were able to do what 
they wanted us to do basically i, I love i love it's almost a, an independent uh, kind of idea putting the sandbags down the ground it's such a simple idea but it's it's, <laughs> it's brilliant as well i love that yeah, yeah. no I, I was going to say i i remember what i do remember is that first shot of chashra coming through the wall um when he makes his first appearance, he looks as if he's walking forward on us, but in fact, he's not. I was actually walking down a ramp and they'd, because of the way the camera was positioned and the way I had to dolly it backwards and it was such a small space, they said, okay, well, what we needed him is, we need him six inches higher at the start of the shot and on the floor at the end of the shot um, for when we do the reverse. And I just remember the, this ha this being discussed. And then the next thing I knew, half an hour, you, know, the, you, you just heard the sawing of wood and the hammering of nails. And there's, there's a ramp for me to walk down, um, you know, yeah. uh, immediately because you've got carpenters on set. Yeah. Or chippies on set to, uh, you know, to, to do all these things for you. I've, uh, since that point, have you kind of, always kind of loved horror is it is it something that's con continued because i've noticed uh some of your highlights and i i love the idea of that short let me find the name of your short film you had is it uh the night whispered is the that, night whisper is that available to watch anywhere online do you know i'm gonna have to double check because i can't remember if i've left it up on my website or not <laughs> We'd love, but, we'd love to be able to share but, that with people you see. Yeah, yeah. Let me, NicholasVince.com. News content. News content. Stores. No, they're not available just at the moment, but I'm sure we can sort. Yeah, they they have been. Actually, no, it is. It's. I think it's called Real House. Um, Night Whispered is available to watch online. The, the others are waiting or either releases or uh, Real House, The Night Whispers is available on Real House. Um, what was that like? Is that something you- As a writer-director, yeah. uh, well, I, this, this was such a learning curve and it was, I did it because I'd been doing the previous incarnation of my YouTube show. This one's called The Chattering Hour and I used to do The Chattering with Nicholas Vince and I was into it back in that, in that uh, series, I was interviewing independent filmmakers. So I got to meet an awful lot of really, really great uh, independent filmmakers, such as Katie Bonham, um, uh, Liam Regan, and all sorts of people. Um, and I thought, you know, having interviewed all these people, I really should give this a go. Um, it was great. It was absolutely fascinating process because um, we filmed it um, fairly close to where I live and it was just like, you know, and it was, it was just, you know, as you say, it was pure, everyone's doing this for their CV. Um, um, so I paid for the insurance and the transport and made sure nobody was out of pocket and we made sure they were all fed and well looked after. Yeah. Because um, it, was, it was just a short film. Um, so yeah, it was it was really fascinating process. It's a very different part of your brain that gets engaged um, when you're. I mean, in that case, I was writing and directing and acting in it, but that was only because I was cheap. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Were you doing all the kind of admin and contacting everyone, doing all of that as well? I did have a producer. I did have a producer uh, working out as well. But I, um, yeah, it's. But of course, it's all hands together, and you know, you end up by doing an awful lot of stuff. We even got my dog, uh, in it, and uh, and I cast my my niece in it, um, and as I say, the dog, my niece, everyone. And we, as it turned out, it was the coldest night of that year. We we filmed it at the beginning of October. Yeah, a couple of years, a couple of weeks, in a, about a week and a half's time three years ago when we filmed it. And it was kind of weather like this. It was like 50, you know, 10, 12 degrees. Yeah. And then on the night we filmed, it dropped to zero. It literally dropped. 
and it was just so cold. It was so cold. All I remember, I mean, all everyone remembers, I think, about that filming was just how very, <laughs> very, very cold it was. Yeah. Um, it was. Well, that's the thing is with independent filmmaking or uh, when you make short films, you you've got to have that camaraderie. Uh, you, everyone's yeah. got to be right. It's not just a payday. This is something I really want to be on the CV. To be yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that can get you. Yeah. That can get you through some tough spots. Like uh, I made this really very short. Um, my first year in university film production, we made this short film in um, London now, and it required okay. me walking into the sea at this temperature. So <gasps> there's a really nice, beautiful wide shot, and it's graded really well. It's really, really nice. But it was the it was the worst conditions and. But when you when you've got that buzz and you've got that drive to do something like that, I think it really can carry you home to to finish it and to to get over those hurdles. But you pay for it later. <laughs> yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how did um how did this what made you kind of change the format of your kind of podcast and change the the um, the show? Well, so basically, we, I finished, I'd, I'd done 140 episodes of um, Chattering with Nicholas events, uh, and I wanted to concentrate on other things, uh, go back to doing, concentrating on writing. And as, as you know, it takes, it takes a lot to put these things together. A lot of and then, time, yeah. Yeah, and then that was it. I had no intention of, um, of doing it again. And then my manager, uh, Chris Rowe, who's based in Los Angeles, at the beginning of lockdown, we were, you know, we were chatting over ideas and he said, you know, be an interesting thing to do. Would you be up for doing this again? Um, and would you like to interview Malcolm McDowell? Duh, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah um, where do you start? Where did you, unless it's a little trade secret, unless you've not released the episode yet, where did you start? How did you start talking about him and his career? How did that? Well, basically winding it, just going back to the very beginning, you know, and 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 starting with Clockwork and and so on. Yeah. The, the, the show's out; you can watch it. It's oh, uh, we'll put a link it, in our description about that. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, um, I think this is a great thing, is because I'm working with Chris that we're choosing people he knows. Um, so we're, I'm working very closely with Chris, who's my producer on this, basically. I think that'll have um, a snowball effect as well, in terms of who you interview going yes, forward. Yes, absolutely. So basically, whereas the previous show was very much along on the lines of speaking to independent filmmakers. And, I, and when I set up the Chattering with Nicholas events, it was very much, I was very, I'm always very conscious of the fun fact just how lucky I was that Clive chose me to be in his film um, and I kind of wanted to pay it forward um, and I thought well this is something kind of interesting to do you know we, we it, this might be fun something fun to do and um, I will possibly be able to talk with some very interesting people. We can have some very interesting conversations about filmmaking, kind of different, different generations talking Absolutely, to each yeah. other. Um, and then with this one, it, again, it's very much, you know, we're concentrating on people who've kind of <laughs> the other end of the spectrum. Um, people yeah. who've been around for a long time. And so again, I'm, I'm finding it really interesting because again, it's kind of similar, but different because obviously I'm talking to my peers about working in the business. Um, although they've had much bigger careers than me. Um, cause I took a long time out to go and work in computers. Um, but they, you know, Malcolm McDowell, Nancy Loomis, Courtney, Courtney Gaines, uh, is another one which is coming out on tomorrow, Thursday. Um, it's Thursday, uh, Los Angeles time. And I'm editing Courtney's interview this evening. That was a fascinating because his career has been, you know, so I'm talking to people who've had careers for 40 years in Hollywood. Yeah. Mine's nothing like that. But, you know, it's, 
really we're still just actors having a chat really about yeah. what it is to do the job of acting um but also they've all got different you know you've all got different experiences as to and you've worked with different directors and you, there are different um things that you learn from each one of them so i'm, I'm absolutely loving it because i'm learning so much like, uh, like about a, the craft of acting like um like what you said about the sandbags it might seem like such a simple thing mm. people that are huge fans of hellraiser and uh, what we're doing at this festival they'll absolutely love that little gem and that's the kind of thing i love to hear um when i spoke to joe Alves about being john carpenter's production designer on escape from new york i asked him whose idea was it isaac hayes is driving around in one of these kind of limousine for trying to find kurt russell and he's got chandeliers that like kind of got this kind of swan arm on the front of the car and they're like headlights but they're proper chandeliers I'm like when you watch the film it's crazy but it's it's in keeping with isaac hayes's character and i asked joe um whose idea was that was it john's or yours oh it was mine and uh, i said well, how did you get to that point and he said well initially it was going to be one of those kind of uh, uh, half dome ones inside the car so you could see Isaac Hayes with a chandelier inside this limousine. I was like, that's crazy. But when the product, the purchaser for his production department <laughs> bought the wrong chandeliers, they're like, we can't take these back. We have to use them somewhere. So they stuck them on the front of the cars. And I said, that must have been a bit of a nightmare. I said, it was because we had to buy dozens more because they kept breaking every time we did a stunt. <laughs> but no, these little gems, these, this, is what I, <laughs> this is what I love. Um, I've loved interviewing filmmakers about and um, with Alex Proyas asked about the rain machines in The Crow. It's just little things like that that ins uh, kind of help to inspire and engage mm -hmm. filmmakers. That's why I started this festival. So I love the idea of your podcast and I will absolutely be recommending it to um, our much. filmmakers and we'll put links in when we can as well. Um, are you doing much on Instagram for that podcast or is it just kind of... Yes, if you, f it's, if you, basically if you find the chattering hour, um, we, as I say, it's, this, is, this show is being produced by Chris Rowe Management and Tea Time Productions. So um, whereas when I did chattering with Nicholas Vince, it was me and then my husband Craig during the show handling all the live questions. These are all pre-recorded -rec shows. But I've got a production team of three supporting me on this. So we have a late, lovely lady called Amanda who's handling all the social media stuff because I don't have time because so, I'm doing all the editing. and um, It's so time-consuming. It's, yeah. it's unreal. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I love like when I put a uh, post out about your interview or uh, Jeffrey Reddick's or a couple of other filmmakers I've got lined up. It's, it's really nice, the idea of social media, but as soon as you delve into it, you realize how much is involved and even just editing, it, you think yeah. it's straight, straightforward, it's so complex. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's uh, yeah, there was something I want to ask you about your, sure. is it a stage, like a monster stage play? You yes, did? yes. So um, at the end of last year, and so, this, so if I hadn't been doing this, this is what I would have been doing. Um, so at the end of last year, I decided to do a one-man show, all about my experiences about making Hellraiser, um, how I got into making films, how I got, you know, more behind the stories on making Hellbound, um, Nightbreed, but also what is it to be a monster? Why do I consider myself a monster? Why have I been made to it? me to feel a monster um so it was basically it was an hour-long show which i did for the london horror festival last year called i am monsters um and it went we did it for three nights um and the reason that i was doing it there was because i've been the patron of the london horror festival uh for the last four years or so and um we should and the london horror festival is the UK's oldest and long, you know, longest running festival of live horror performance. So that's another thing I've been delighted to have been part of. Um, and yeah, so I was up at the Pleasant Theatre in London, did that for three nights. And the plan was that this year I was going to be taking it out on tour. 
yeah, and then, not going to happen and, this year. Then the world ended, yeah. Um, yeah. An, an online version of that or adapting it some way could be quite interesting. Yeah, I really want to. I, it's the thing with, with one man shows, you really want to do it in front of a live audience. Yeah. Um, you know, my, what I had always said that I wanted to do a, um, a film version of it. But ideally, what I wanted to do was to film three nights with different audiences and with cameras in slightly different positions yeah. um, so that you could get three, you know, you get three bites of the run. Absolutely, just that's what. That's live what's, performance. Yeah. That's when, a when you hear about stand-up comedians when they do a recording for, say, Netflix or whoever it's for, they, they can they can almost manipulate the energy into what you want in the final version as well. Because yes. you, you yeah, might yeah. have moments that are truly, oh, that's fantastic how that went. But the second night's not as good, but there's a moment in that second night that is great. Yeah, um, yeah. I think yeah. It's, it's, still, it's definitely still possible to do that. Um, but obviously the audience, that's not going to be there. That's the problem, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that's, you know, and as I say, the original idea was I wanted to take it out you know, my original idea was I'd take it into fringe theatres in the country. Yeah. Sadly, I don't know how many of those are going to be surviving next. I know year. it's it's extremely scary to think about outside of your own circumstances how how businesses have just been turned completely upside down. Uh, like my the cro closest thing to, if I'm honest, to religion for me is going to the cinema. You know, in terms of mm -hmm. the, the moments you have, the stories that are being told being scared shitless and having a laugh uh, and it it's really kind of terrifying for people's just livelihoods just disappearing overnight and it's yeah it, and for it, this kind of industry it's um, the film industry it's extremely difficult and hopefully we'll, we'll see green shoots coming out of it in terms of uh, different approaches I think there'll be a lot of positivity coming out of it as well Yes. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I touch wood. I mean, I, we can always rely on human ingenuity um, to come up with things and, and so on. But it's going to be a different world 2021. Whatever happens, it's going to be a very different world, I think. Yeah. But, you know, I think people will adjust. Um, people obviously want to be able to watch new material. So they're, Absolutely, you know, yeah. and those are people who are you know able to uh, carry on working and have still got jobs. You know they are keeping. You know, Amazon and Netflix are getting more subscribers. Though there's, you know, a, in theory, or in my theory, yeah, um, there will be you know there will be more productions happening again at some point in the future. I'm sure. I think these streaming companies have finally realised it's like companies like Shudder. And Arrow, Arrow Video, they realised how 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 big the audience is in, in terms of mm. streaming content and horror is so mm. potent mm. now. Mm. Um, and with that, I wanted to ask you about how did it how did it come to um, writing some uh, stories for Marvel? How did that work? Um, so basically, this is this is this is going back, um, and so I should have said earlier on just the quick time out i can probably only give you about another 10 minutes that's so, absolutely fine nicholas that's fine is that right? yeah, yeah, but, yeah. yeah okay so, to answer that question about comics so this was basically happened during um my breed um there was a scene that is in the um uh the director's cut where Anne bobby is who plays Laurie is singing in a nightclub um, and Clive basically got all his mates because obviously Clive is a huge comics uh, comic reader um, and they were talking about doing the Hellraiser comics during the filming of Nightbreed and um, I used money from um, going to from Nightbreed to go to visit the States. Um, and I just pitched up at Marvel offices, had the um, uh, name of the uh, 
the editor I just waltzed in and said hi I'd like to talk to them <laughs> didn't have any point or anything yeah. and um, but he, he just bought the he bought the, you know, the, the thing and then that led to working with Marvel UK uh, working with Epic Comics because Hellraiser was an Epic comic uh, which is part of Marvel um, um, yeah so it was great I, I spent three years writing comics and had a great deal of fun and again met some really talented talented artists such as John Bolton um, during that time We've got um, we've got an artist that worked uh, with Ramsey Campbell on a couple of his uh, covers called Dave Kendall, and he's wor- he's been working uh, on Judge Death uh, stuff for 2008 at the moment. Oh wow! And, and he's judging. Uh, he's one of our uh, festival judges, and he I spoke to him a few weeks ago about the festival and what he needs to do, and he's the nicest guy in the world. But when you look at his material, it's the darkest stuff. <laughs> it's really sinister, and it's. Would you, would you say that of your experience of working with filmmakers and other actors that the ones that kind of gravitate towards horror, are they kind of light as air in many ways, but they have kind of dark thoughts and they focus that? Yeah, I think basically they get it. We get it out of our system. Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask you a little question. This is for something next year, if you're interested uh, mm-hmm. in being a cosplay judge for our festival next year. And all they require is just picking some of your favourites because we've had some outstanding cosplays that are next level. They look like movie level. That's how good they are. Uh, I, I, I would be delighted. I'd be delighted to do that. That sounds a great deal of fun. Yes. And I thought I'm it always, would be always... kind of a perfect thing for you to come yeah, yeah. from. Yeah. So what yeah. I'll do is um, in, a few mon- in a few months' time, or I'll kind of just kind of keep touch base with you every so often about when our interview is going out and then i'll put you in touch with michael chan who's our um, community content producer uh there's only there's only three of us but we've kind of done so much uh but i think michael will be delighted that uh, you could be a judge on that and uh, alex Alex proyas is going to be our festival judge again next year which is great uh so yeah thank you very much nicholas this has been a real treat for me good 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 all right uh, good luck with the podcast i really look forward to watching that all right then, and if you, um, so whilst we've still got the chat up, let me type up. So, uh, rather than sending people to the website, let me send you to. Um, so the chattering hour is, as I say, is produced by Chris Rowe Management. Um, so you have to go to the Chris Rowe Management YouTube channel. Okay. To, uh, that's right, I'm just opening up my wonderful that's Trello, cool. where I've actually got the links. Because um, actually, occasionally, I'm, I haven't got my glasses on. Uh, no, it's bitly links. There we are. See how I'm in YouTube. That's what we want. I, I would have asked right. Malcolm McDowell about Star Trek, but it's called a big Trekkie. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was outstanding. Oh, we, in that we, film. we ran out of time anyway. We ran out of time anyway. Um, I should have said that the, uh, the Chattering Hour is also a, um, it's both YouTube and it's a podcast as well. Fantastic. So it's on yeah. Apple Podcasts as well. But those are bitly links to. Um, oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. That's great. So you can just share those. Those will, those will get people to the. Excellent. So thank you very much, Nicholas. And it's a pleasure. real pleasure. And I'll keep in touch with you about next year. And you won't get you won't get spammed with email. It'll just be like what's every song. <laughs> but what I'll actually do is send mm. you uh, five or six of our best. Because uh, there's a lady in Brazil, I think it's Brazil or Argentina, who was the pinhead, and her it's unreal, unreal the pictures she done. So. Uh, it'll get to give you a taste of what we've got. Uh, right, next year right, here. right, right. Oh, people are amazing. They are absolutely amazing. All right, then, well, sir, I need day, to run. Have a good day, Take mate. care, sir. See you Bye. 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 Bye.